those points that have to do mostly with the practice of law. I had a client, I, I, I think overall, the way I would describe my life is uh, I listened to uh, Mr. Cole in the last hour, and I was the guy who did none of that stuff. And uh, I was the guy who did everything wrong, I think. And so I was at a particular point of despair. I had a you know, about uh, $2 million in my trust account for a client. And they owed me about $170,000 for my fee in recovering that. And uh, that I received a direction from them to wire it to Florida as it happens and without paying me the fee that I was owed. And I had not written my, I was naive. I hadn't written my uh, agreement well enough. And I realized I had to send it and it was going to Florida. I was never going to see that money again. I'd worked very hard. I worked every day that year. And uh, my net income for the year was negative $12,652. My lease was ending. I needed first and last month's rent. And I didn't know what I was going to do next. I had a nice jury verdict. It was in excess of $1.3 million. So I thought I was due a nice contingency. And then a judge uh, threw it out. He granted a motion for new trial, you know, and like judges, you know, they just they just do that stuff. Uh, I wasn't going to be able to pay Christmas bonuses. And that was a source of deep embarrassment to me. My personal life was in disarray. I was going through my second divorce. I can tell you something about a second divorce. Uh, the first one is always the other person's fault. The second one is when you have to come face to face with the fact that the problem is you. I was paying for three homes and I was living in a crummy apartment. I thought I had a great new girlfriend. And then she broke up with me. I mean, the cumulative effect of everything that was happening left me in a deep, almost suicidal despair. And really, it's hard to remember that pain. New Year's was the one day you couldn't work in Pasadena, where my office was. There's a big parade there. So I climbed to the top of a trail in Pasadena, and I proceeded to get lost in the Angeles National Forest. And somewhere in there, a I was tired, I was thirsty, maybe delirious, I don't know, but I heard a voice. And this is what it said to me. Until you learn to be grateful for the things you have, you will not receive the things that you want. Now, this voice was insistent and persistent, and it had specific words directed to me. My thought was, what the hell do I have to be grateful for? Now I found my way back down. I mean, eventually, if you go down, you'll you'll get out of the hills and out of the forest. And I processed this uh, voice in uh, a way that was very specific, and I describe in the book. But the the plan that I came up with was to write one thank you note a day for the entire year of two thousand eight. I almost didn't do it. I uh, but on the third day, of course, I had done nothing by January third, but. The, the young woman who had broken up with me wrote me a thank you note. I think she did that because her mom was once the queen of the Rose Bowl parade. And so they both had perfect manners. And when I got that, I realized that, you know, I had some Christmas presents. So there was an opportunity, my first opportunity to write thank you notes. And one of my Christmas presents was from my son. Uh, it was a perfect gift. It was a, a coffee maker that I needed for my new crummy apartment. And I I started to write him a thank you note. And, and I was embarrassed because I realized I didn't even know his address. Uh, that's how far I was drifting away from uh, a young man that I love and that I speak to every day now. So I wrote him a thank you note and called him to get his address. And a couple days later, he called to ask me out to lunch. And after lunch, uh, this was really revolutionary. Uh, he picked up the check. But even more, he shoved an envelope of cash across the, the table. 
And I said, well, what's this for? And he goes, I'm paying back the loan. Now, as parents, we all have those loans, right? But we don't ever expect to get them paid back. So I was going to push it back across the table. Um, and that was an example of, of a real character weakness I had, which was I didn't allow anybody to do anything for me. I didn't allow people to get close to me in that way. But at the moment I was going to push that money back, I started to think to myself, you know, I really need this money. So I took it and I, uh, I think that was a moment for him to grow up and, uh, and he needed to pay me back. Uh, but I had this thought, you know, this thank you note thing, it really works. So I that encouraged me to keep going and going. And at every step of the way, as I relate in my book, that whenever I was despairing, something would happen to remind me that the thank you notes were good. I thought I had nothing to be grateful for, but I had three beautiful children that I was failing to appreciate. At the time, I had uh, an amazing eight-year-old daughter, and she didn't think my apartment was crummy. When she came over, she made it into a home, and uh, a wonderful home for the two of us. And uh, so I, I, there were many wonderful uh, memories there. I wrote her a thank you note, which I believe she still has today. Uh, my favorite moment of that year with her was uh, we were at the swimming pool of that apartment. If you can imagine this place, it doesn't heat up the swimming pool and crummy leaves get over on the top of it and it's cold. But she jumped in and, uh, you know, I remember she said to me, uh, are you coming in? And I go, well, I don't think so. And she goes, oh, come on. Uh, be a man, you know. So that was the a, a great moment because I needed to grow up. I needed to take responsibility for my ac actions. You know, it, I it took a while, but I started to receive the things that I wanted. Uh, it became. I'm not. I don't try to market this book or try and convince you that this is this is the key to success or wealth. Um, but I started to receive the things that I did want. And, and it was a process of risk because I had 365 notes to write. So I had to reach out uh, and renew friendships with people I'd virtually forgotten. Some of those good contacts that, that uh, Mr. Cole was describing that had done good things for me. And uh, sometimes I, I reached out in forgiveness, trying to heal broken relationships. I and you know that year I I said I was sorry to a lot of people and in trying to become a better person I was finding those people and asking them to forgive me and every once in a while I received the gift of forgiveness for which I was truly grateful and I wrote a thank you note for that the gift birth the book gives a lot of examples I was doing I think overall what I was trying to do was come up with things I could do that would give me an opportunity to write a thank you note. Uh, like I would run a marathon for charity and that caused me to uh, thank all the people who donated. Uh, and it also caused me to get back in shape. I, as I say, this is not a weight loss book either, but this process that I came upon will cause you to change your life. Now, I, I want to talk specifically about the practice of law. Uh, with regard to my clients, I was spending too much time on clients that weren't good for me, people who would uh, cheat you out of $170,000 of fees that you had validly earned by recovering millions of dollars for them, for example. Um, and what I found was I had to let those people go. And I started to identify on my list, my good clients, the clients that were paying their bills. And, you know, it was a small business. And so all of you know, it's a truly great thing when someone pays their bill and it's a, ma a marvelous thing when they pay it on time. Most people, the lawyers are the last people that they pay. Uh, so the effect of these thank you notes was that people started paying their bill faster. Uh, and they could count on a thank you note from me when they did that. And 
those so those who were paying late started to pay on time those that were paying on time started to pay faster i i had a a, a client who was an in-house lawyer was my biggest client and he was so amazed by this handwritten thank you note that he put it up on his board and that was his reminder that he might have had 30 40 bills to pay every month but mine was going to be the first one you know amplifying what mr cole said about referrals uh i was doing some research in the law library and i believe i came across a rule that used to be a rule of the los angeles county bar association which said that whenever somebody referred a case to you you had to write a personal note of of gratitude it it it, it were typed but you know in this day and age people really appreciate the handwritten note because they know that didn't come from a machine. I have AI on my computer that whenever somebody does something for me on the in the email, it automatically tells me to thank them and gives me the language to thank them. So, you know, now we we just wonder, am I being responded to by a machine or a real person? But a note takes out that uh, that doubt. Now, I this lawyer was a good friend, and he sent me a perfect case, uh, just what I wanted and really needed in my practice. It was a case I could win because, you know, I hated losing. I mean, most of us do. And it was a case that I could win before the client became unhappy about how much that was costing. So I, I, I sent him this thank you note, which kind of rocked him. And he called me up and he said, hey, I didn't even know you you wanted cases, but if you like this one, I've got a lot more and I can send those to you. So, you know, as it turned out, 2008 was a bad year for most of us. Uh, and I had, But I had just come from a bad year. And as, as it, it turned out, I had a really good year. My best client was one of those banks that went belly up. And uh, so I lost my biggest client uh, but nevertheless, by the time that happened in July, I had lots of new clients. And uh, now my employees, I wrote each of them a thank you note to to thank you them for being patient with me. I thank them for packing up and all the stress of our moving offices. And they wrote thank you notes to me, which I really appreciated. Uh, but better yet, they wrote thank you notes to each other. And that really brought us together. We pulled together, we came out of our tailspin. We had great, we moved into great new offices. And in May, the Christmas bonuses were paid. Now, writing a thank you note every day, you you'll there's been a lot of research since I wrote the book. And, and uh, gratitude is a kind of cognitive behavioral therapy. And... Uh, uh, you know, I found that when people would ask me, you know, how is it going? You know, I was one of those sad sacks who would say, oh, you know, OK. And then if they inquired further, I would tell some sad story. Uh, and I but I started to change. I noticed I and it was kind of automatic. You know, I just started saying what I was grateful for. And it was usually something I'd written about the previous night in my in my thank you note. And I, I realized that that I was being transformed. Uh, one of the, the big problems that I have, as I said, is I uh, I felt nobody was very grateful to me. You know, I thought people should be writing me thank you notes. Right. And. Uh, well, as it, it turns out, they started doing that, you know, when you send out gratitude, you begin to send it back. Not every time. It's not. It's not a machine, but it it does happen. Uh, and you know, I also had a problem, as I said, receiving grace and help from others. You know, one example I'll have is always fighting for the check. You know, always never wanting to accept help from people who who offer it. Um, you know, I mean, Mr. Cole just graciously offered him himself, you know, and uh, I, 
in this year, I decided, you know, oh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to accept that help. I accepted that money from my son. And the reason I did it actually in the in the near moment was because I, I needed something to write a thank you note about if I was going to make 365. So uh, but it it really helped me learn to get over a character defect I had of not being willing to accept help. You know, I, I do, I, I'm going to skip over the whole story because I've got some other things I want to talk about, but, you know, uh, it also makes you more realistic, uh, writing thank you notes. Uh, we all have a ledger in our head, you know, in which uh, we are always ahead of the other person because of what they uh they haven't done for us and what we've done for them. But when I wrote thank you notes, I started a ledger of, uh, of the people I was writing to. And, you know, it could be partially your, your uh, client development list that Mr. Cole was talking about. It was a spreadsheet. And uh, I, uh, I still have that spreadsheet and uh it's uh it's my one of my few visual aids today i had to go next door to fedex to to print it out because otherwise i would be charged with a huge waste of of county resources but this is what it looks like today when you print it out uh i've written uh somewhere around 1600 personal thank you notes not counting uh, another spreadsheet i have for people who wrote me a letter uh, about reading my book and the, you know, I, I'm now, uh, a, a person who I, I don't know anybody in my life that gets more thank you notes. I have boxes of them. I value each one. I have them in my backpacks. I have them everywhere. Uh, the one that means the most to me right now is this one here, uh, that, uh, my son, my son was uh, kind of out of touch with all of us. This is a different son than the one I was describing. Uh, because of COVID, I mean, he withdrew into himself and and wouldn't communicate. And, you know, it was, it, it was something that, that just was breaking all of our hearts. But he came over and uh, uh, last Thanksgiving and uh, he brought with him this note, which... Uh, thanked each one of us for for standing by him and you know trying to keep everything open so that someday he would come back but i have thousands i'm also the person that uh you know if you do something for me uh you know i'm going to write you a thank you note and uh as a result people do things for me just to see if i will write a note and and then i do get it so i i uh if you're all sitting down, what I would ask you to do for a moment is just, just stand up and breathe, uh, you know, and uh, I, I want to tell you about a, a little bit of an exercise that I go through every day when I'm running. Uh, it takes longer. I do see people standing up, so I know you need to do that. Uh, but just breathe. I I, uh, I have a, a when we switch benches, switch courtrooms, judges will leave notes and my fate for the next judge. And my favorite one was a little post-it note that just said, breathe. But uh, I'd like you just to, when you breathe, just close your eyes, try to be somewhere else. And the exercise involves imagining a spiral. Spiral is, is I've learned, the symbol of uh, gratitude. I, I, I pray every day that it doesn't end up on my daughter somewhere as a tattoo. But uh, I mean, as you imagine the spiral, just start to think of of the place on on that spiral closest to you are the people who mean the most to you that you're most grateful for the gifts in your life that you're most grateful for and just let yourself go around that spiral now you'll have to practice that at home because i i do want to move on but i just uh, I, i'm thankful to all of you who stood up and and just got a little more air in you um, you know, the, the, uh, I, I read a book once called the power of appreciation and they, 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 they had like diagrams of 
your brain on uh, your angry brain and then your brain on gratitude, which glowed in a nice warm way. And, you know, when I, I try to do that at least once a day, uh, but I will say that writing a thank you note is a more powerful thing because uh, what you're doing is you're reaching out to another person, your little gratitude journal, your gratitude thing is a good thing. But when you reach out to another person, you affect them and you uh, you give meaning to their life. You know, when the book was published, CBS News wasn't quite sure they believed everything I said. So they they tracked down one of the baristas who I at Starbucks who had written a note to. And it turned out she had it in her pocket every day. And they asked her, why is this in your pocket? And, and she said, because when I read this, it, it shows that that what I do has meaning. It gives me meaning. It means that I'm important. And I think that's what we're all feeling, a lot of us, that we don't matter. Um, but this was telling her that what she does every day, just in giving coffee to people, it really does matter. Okay, so I wanted to talk about sobriety and the practice of law. Uh, I'm going to try to get done by two o'clock. I think that's when I'm supposed to finish. Is that right, John? We can extend out probably 10 minutes. Okay. Well, well okay, well, I'll try to do that. Um, you know, uh, now there were moments uh, before I received this message when I wondered whether the practice of law made any sense once you get sober you know when you when you get sober you realize that there are certain things that make sense only when you're drinking and uh sushi is one of my favorite examples makes sense only when you're drinking sake but uh las vegas makes absolutely no sense when you're not drinking and i worried that the, maybe the practice of law was one of those things and for some of you actually it might be you know, after getting sober, I really realized that I needed to change the way I was approaching the practice of law and, and take some of Mr. Cole's suggestions. Also, you know, I needed to, uh, to, to, I felt I needed to become a judge. By the way, I forgot to say some things and I'm going to say it. My name is John and I'm an alcoholic. I'm not afraid to say that anymore. I highly recommend honesty. Although I realize some of you aren't a year and a half from retirement like I am. So I, I get that I can have more honesty and more freedom. Actually, you know, my wife is looking at me every day, just wondering what my honesty, uh, what my honest, what trouble my honesty is going to get me into and whether that's going to mean that I don't get my pension. But uh, I, I, I realize that some of you are not in the position to be completely honest. I will say this as an advocate of honesty. Honesty is a rare treasured phenomenon in, in the courtrooms of Los Angeles. It's probably different in Florida, but everywhere these days, there is so much attention seeking dishonesty. And the fact of the matter is that real honesty attracts very little negative attention. When my book came out, I was worried about how open and I, honest I was being. And actually, there was no, no blowback from that. So I am an alcoholic. It took me a long time to say those words. I was 51 when I finally surrendered. I didn't even stop after my doctor told me I was an alcoholic and that my liver was beginning a process that would end in death. I resisted. I did not want to surrender. Surrender is hard for lawyers. It's hard. It was hard for me. The one thing I have always thought about litigation was that hard work and not giving up almost never fails to make any situation better. My favorite rock songs were things like No Retreat, No Surrender, I Won't Back Down. And I know, you know, th those are things that we've all said more colorfully to our opposing counsel. So when I finally went to a meeting, I was saying, who are these losers who are talking about surrender? The moment of surrender is The Razor's Edge for us. The Razor's Edge is a book by Somerset Maugham that I highly recommend. And if you don't have time, there's two pretty good movies, but you really have to read the book 
the epigraph of the book comes from an Indian uh, uh, Upanishad, and uh, it says, the sharp ev edge of a razor is difficult to pass over. Thus the wise say, the path of salvation is hard. And it, it, you can find this in the New Testament too, where it says, you know, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You can substitute any false god for those riches. You can substitute alcohol. You know, the razor's edge is we, where we all want to be practicing law. It's thrilling, it's dangerous, and it's very hard to give up. You know, sim 16 years later, and I still have bad moments when I want to get back up on the razor's edge, try a different drug, another addictive app. You know, they're always saying this drug is not bad for you. Uh, another new drink, you know, there's always new drinks. But there's also the thrilling job that's beyond your capacity, that that ability to to work the 14 hour days and make it stick. There's this great new case that you really can't handle, but you're comp you you want to stay up on that razor's edge. The wind is blowing in your hair, um, and uh, you are you are making it. You're on the edge. Um, now the insight today that I, I have that keeps me from going back on the edge is is a Bob Dylan song, believe it or not, that, that repeats over and over in my head. And the words are, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or maybe the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And the song reminds me that at the moment of surrender, I, I wasn't choosing to stay in the thrill. I wasn't choosing not to surrender. I was just really choosing who I was going to surrender to. You know, I had already surrendered. I'd surrendered 30 years of potential. I'd surrendered two marriages. I'd surrendered two houses in which those marriages struggled. And I almost surrendered three children. The razor's edge is not the point of surrender. It's just the point where you decide who you're surrendering to. Now, I have a couple more stories for you. I hope I'll get them in. Um, at least one, uh, you know, uh, the first is about my surrender. Two days before I surrendered, I crossed the threshold of a state prison to conduct the deposition of a drunk driver. He'd killed two people while driving drunk in the wrong direction on the five freeway. At the airport, the only car they had to rent to me was a Chrysler Sebring. That was the very car that the drunk driver had been driving. That night, I was having some beers and eating dinner when I learned that I couldn't go into the prison in jeans. Now, you can go to the U.S. Senate in jeans, I think, at least last week, but you can't go into the state prison in Jamestown, California in jeans. So I got up from the dinner and I went in search of a men's store. And in that area, fine men's clothing is available in polyester only and only in the men's section of the neighborhood, Walmart. Luckily, they're open late. And then I drove back and had several more fine German beers. The next morning, we went into the prison. We sat at a folding table in a large gymnasium, and the defendant came in. He was 22 years old. He was in jeans, and he seemed to be afraid of me. Now, according to him, he'd been at a party he didn't remember. He believed that some jello shots were involved, but he was steadfast that nothing could be recalled. I had some good hotel coffee in me and I was aggressive. This man was smaller than me and I was gonna go after him. I asked him about the young men he had killed. Do you know their names? I don't. Have you made any attempt to find out what their names are? My lawyer told me not to because of the legal proceedings. I said, well, you, you killed two people that night, right? Yes. And you haven't even tried to find their names out? Now, at this point, the lawyer started interrupting me. You've asked your question, John. He's responded to you. But I wasn't going to be denied. And I was in a high moral state at that point. So I said, I would like one more response. You haven't tried to find out their names? No. And now I was in charge. And I was very angry. So I take it you haven't apologized to any of these people. My lawyer's been telling me not to because of the proceedings taking place. 
Do you acknowledge any responsibility for what happened that night? I said, of course, my actions were careless. Now the anger was rising in my voice. It's no longer just inside of me. Your actions were careless? Yes, I thought I had taken every precaution to make it a safe evening, but everything I tried to set in place just didn't take place. You recognize that you are responsible for the death and injuries that took place on the freeway that night? Yes. You don't contest that you were driving the wrong way on the freeway? I don't recall driving the wrong way, but those were my actions, yes. So this guy couldn't remember what it said in the police report about how he begged for a lawyer, how he worried incessantly about the damage to his own car while he was sitting in the police car. He was oblivious to the fact that India innocent lives had ended. He couldn't remember getting in the car, etc. He was just a well-meaning good kid. He'd never been in trouble, didn't have a problem. But I'd sat next to his victim's mother in a conference room when the prosecutor handed over the photos of her son lying dead on the side of the road, a hopeful young life murdered by jello shots. And so I continued. I had not had enough. The transcript reflects a long battle with the opposing lawyer, which I'll leave out, but I was on a high moral plateau that morning and I prevailed. You say it was careless? Is that the only adjective you would use? How would you characterize your actions? He said, it's uncharacteristic of me. If I would see it from someone else's perspective, I would see it as careless. Now I was disgusted. You, would you see it as stupid? Of course. Criminal? Yes. And then I had the answer that I wanted. And we took a break. A hypocrite arose from my side of the table, having achieved this howl victory. The young man was not ready to admit he was powerless over alcohol. He may never be. But I was ready, and I was aware that I was the hypocrite in that room. That young man may never receive peace for his torment, and I pray his story ends another way. My anger was truly with myself. For 30 years, I'd been killing the brain cells that had been God's gift to me. I'd been killing my power to distinguish myself and do something worthwhile in my life. I'd been killing the families I was trying to start. And the previous night, I might have killed somebody on the road. I'd been surrendering all right. It was time to surrender to God instead. I could give you a list of all the wonderful things that have resulted from that surrender, but it would take too long. There were two other defiant souls who started in the rooms with me. They didn't make it. One of them is described in that dark noir novel I told you about. You can read about it if you have the inclination. He blew his head off. My other friend drank his liver away. So at the bottom of everything, I'm most thankful just to be alive. And I've become reconciled to the good things I killed when I was drinking. Of uh, the two marriages that I'll never get back. Sometimes when we kill things, they never come back to life. And we have to accept that. I want one more story. And that's a story about how honesty in sobriety is difficult. And how it can be worth the cost. The story is in the book, but I left out some important details that I wasn't ready to share. I'd been a lawyer for about 30 years when I filled out the application to be a judge. It was a 60-page application for me. I had, of course, to say a lot of things about my career in that application. But then I came to a very difficult question. And the question was this. Have you ever been treated for alcoholism? Well, the answer, I said to myself, is probably no. I wasn't sure. I'd never been to a treatment facility. But I had been attending meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, as I said, saved my life. I asked my sponsor at the time how I should answer the question. He was a retired plumber, but he told me exactly what I had to say if I wanted to stay his sponsee. He said, you say exactly this. No, but I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, not long after I submitted my application, I was interviewed by a panel of people who vet your application. And 
I was told that more than 50 people had written letters of support for me and that not one person had anything negative to say about me, which was unusual because, you know, after 30 years, most people have at least one enemy who's willing to say so. So they were very surprised by that. And that was all good. That was the first two minutes of the interview. Then they said they had one answer on my application that they wanted to talk to me about. And that was the answer that the plumber had told me to put. So for an hour, I was grilled about my drinking and whether I was really sober and how my life had straightened out or not and whether I was going to go back to it. And I, you know, I was grilled for an hour by, I think it was five people on that one question. Well, at the end of it, I was exhausted and devastated. My new sponsor was a lawyer and he said, you never should have answered that question that way. And I, I heard nothing at all for a year and a half. And that is unusual. Usually that's just one step on the process, a sign that it's picking up and it's going to end. You know, so I went on with my life. I signed a new lease. And then suddenly out of the blue in my year of writing thank you notes, I received a note that Arnold Schwarzenegger was running a credit check on me. And I was like, what the heck for? But then I realized. So my honesty cost me, uh, although I didn't have to pay full price. But I also never have to worry that I wasn't being completely truthful. And that's that's a comfort that keeps me from returning to the razor's edge. I want to leave you with this, uh, just reflecting back on the voice that I heard, because, you know, it was a book for mass publication, so I didn't want to think, want to speculate about where I thought the voice came from. And I've searched the internet, trying to see if I was just remembering something that somebody uh, that, that I'd read somewhere. Uh, there are similar things in the Bible and other insp inspirational literature, but there's nothing quite like that. And this one was directed personally at me. I have surrendered to the notion that it was a higher power, and I have decided to keep surrendering. Now, God willing, I'm going to make it to retirement. You know, I'm 68, so at any moment, you know, something could happen to us. As Vin Scully uh, who was always the most beloved person in Los Angeles, used to say, we are all day to day. But God willing, I'm going to make it. And my retirement plan is to give the rest of my life to God. Now, for some of you, I realize the next step is unclear. You may bring your life back under control. I I, I certainly recommend Mr. Cole's methods to, to doing that. I, I think you know, as I got sober, I, I think more of those things started to make perfect sense to me. I knew them, but I was disregarding them. Um, but, you know, for some of you, the next step is unclear. So I just say, step down from the razor's edge. Don't go near it. And I would say, listen. In our cruel, pushy world, I think we need to stop and really say a few simple words more often. Words like, thank you, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. And that's what I try to do. So with any luck, I've left a few minutes for, uh, for questions, which I'm happy to answer. Um, I don't know, might be- uh, Judge, just let me uh, jump in quickly on behalf of everybody here. I know John will be looking for comments and questions in chat, but what a what a wonderful message! And the, I just am again just so I guess grateful is the word, right? How you how you describe in very practical terms what the mechanical act of gratitude produced for you and produced around you, and the things you describe getting are the things that um, I think we all want. It was just, it was beautifully done, Judge. Uh, John may not give me a book, but I'm going to buy one. And thanks for being here. Back, back to the group. Well, I say I, I was very, you know, down about my life and and whether it was any good or not. Um, 
But, you know, when I look back today and I look at this spreadsheet, I, you know, I, many of these gifts were already in my life. I just didn't realize it. I just didn't recognize it. I didn't realize tr people were trying to help me. I didn't often enough realize people were trying to love me. You know, <laughs> it was true. It's true. Um, and so often based in the fear we can't get out of. So uh, it's great. John, do you have are there? I, I'm trying to see. I guess we're, well, I guess we're uh, in good shape on that question. I, uh, it's hard to talk after that. It's uh, There's a lump in my throat, Judge. That was just special and we really appreciate it. And, and from the comments here, it looks like a lot of people feel the same. Um, got, the first comment was, they just bought your book online. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it says a great program I'm really moved by this comment that just has all caps unbelievable I am challenged because you know this is something we can all do and I want to thank you for laying that out for us and the possibility and, and my wife and I fight over the book that you sent me that you should generously autographed and uh, you know the lessons are are wonderful and hearing you describe it in your own voice was really, really amazing for us. So, well, I'm very grateful to to be here. I didn't, I don't, uh, I, I'm not a speaker or anything. Obviously, I've got a day job, and um, <clears throat> you know, as you get older, it gets harder and harder to get that day job done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you know, I, I obviously I care about people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol. Well. And, and and with every issue, it seems you, uh, you know, you, you don't seem to discriminate about what they're, they're struggling with. So no. we appreciate that. Appreciate okay. that. Your honor, generosity. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch. We will okay. be. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank, thank you. you, Judge. Beautiful. Take Beautiful. care, everyone. You too. God bless you all. God bless. So John, you may you may have a wrap up, but if I could just say congratulations on a five hour CLE program that ends at five after five, that's doing pretty darn well. So uh, well done. I and I know many of the panelists have have, have already left, but I want to thank all of them again for just a, really making for a very special afternoon for for me, and I hope for many more than me. Uh, and uh, for all the participants and, and uh, visitors who showed up today, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm so glad we got to spend this this time together and kind of take in what we got to uh, to hear today together. And uh, so uh, I wish everybody a great weekend. And, and uh, thanks again, uh, FLA staff, for all the hard work that went into this. And that was in the formal close. So, John, I, I'll, I'll turn it back to you with my thanks for for putting together such a great afternoon and don't close this out dan when we do finish here because i want to um capture some of the comments to send to the judge but uh i want you'll look at the screens you'll notice the reference number is up for the workshop it's five C cle's general and the specialty cle's professionalism mental health and wellness substance ethics and bias elimination are all outlined there in their numbers I'd encourage you to pull out your phones. Um, I, we also can, we can put this online without the reference number. So if you have any question about the breakdown, I'll see if we can't get this posted to our website when we post the videos. That will probably be about 14 days before we can get the videos up, particularly since um, we're going to, we're, many of us will be out of the office next week for a lawyer's uh, assistance conference. Any I'm just looking if anybody raises their hand or anything want has to say anything, feel free. Um, I'm trying to look at the chats. Don, Lauren, if you guys will keep an eye on the chats, I don't want to miss any questions people have about the CLE number. Is this helpful with the breakdown?
Okay, well, I think everyone had ample time to take screenshots or the credit CLE slide again. Well, I just got a text. Do you mean the... Maybe that she doesn't see the number at the top. Hmm. Let me go back one one space. That one? Oh, she got it. Great. Or he. Yeah, and it was also on the on the top of the second slide. It broke okay. down the uh, but we'll we'll leave this Zoom open for a, a while so that we can capture comments and all that sort of thing. And uh, um, but uh, I believe at this point we're finished with the with the program, are we? Indeed, we are. Thanks again, everybody, for being here with us this afternoon. And uh, we're always here for you. And uh, anything we can do for you, just uh, be in touch. Yeah, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Appreciate all the nice comments and um, and the and the good feedback. Thank you. Great job, John. Really good. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. I, I I get a lot of help here. I get a lot of recognition um, <laughs> because everybody else does the hard work and lets me do these things. All Thank right. you, John. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sticking with it. And I'll thanks for all, leave the, I'll leave all the help the last minute. That everything you folks jumped in and, and helped me manage. Appreciate <clears> it. <throat> Let me get on this chat, Dan. It will just take me a minute. I'm going to stop share. Thanks again, John. That was a really pleasant surprise and I appreciate it. Diane Holmes, you um I'm assuming Elaine has your address. We can mail you the book. Yes, you do. Okay, yeah, great. Based on, based on these afternoon presentations, we gotta get everybody's yeah, physical addresses. I got a lot of notes to write here. But Diane, great. great to see you. Thanks for all you're you're doing to help out. Sure, glad to, glad to. Somebody's asking a question, John, about the course type. Is it a webinar or classified as online? And I think that's what they're asking about in posting their CLE credits or something. Yeah, webinar, and we actually characterize it um, as webinar live and online because mm -hmm. we do post it so mm -hmm. i don't think you can go wrong there but definitely webinar live if you were here today mm -hmm. good to see everyone Great to see you. Luis, I don't know if you're still nearby and within earshot, but uh, just want to say thank you for all you did to make the, you know, if there's a Wizard of Oz, it's you who works behind the curtain there and keeps everything running and makes the tech work and all that. And, and appreciate Chuts, Chuts and Bowen for uh, l giving you the chance to help us out like this every year. And, and it just makes a world of difference. So thank you, my friend. Lewis, this was, um, you were so effective that I forgot you were on here like this time. It was like, you got it running so smoothly now. This is just great. Okay.
Okay, I've got everything I need pulled off there. And y'all from down there, let me know if there's anything else you need me to do up here in Orlando. Oh, I'll be in Orlando um, the 23rd and 24th and 25th of October. I will make sure I give you a call. Um, and we've got some visits to do. They've been invited over to um, Morgan and Morgan and have some uh, some a couple of students there who are doing great. Um, it'll be fun to get a meeting in with some folks. Okay. Yeah, just let me know. All right. Lewis, I won't call you at six in the morning or after 11 o'clock at night until next year. Uh, same time. <laughs> Dude, I can't thank you enough, man. Can't thank you enough. Can't hear you either. Hey, here we go. No, uh, uh, genuinely, it's always a pleasure to help out. And, you know, I'm, and well, any anything you guys ever need, you, you have my phone number, John. You can give me a call whenever. No worries, my friend. Yeah, well, you know, at some point, uh, Dan McDermott and I, one of us will be stopping down at your office to say hi. And, uh, you know, hopefully, yeah. hopefully buy you a pastrami sandwich. Or <laughs> 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 hey and Tiffany all right. for all your help too great to see you here today and thank you for having you're, me oh you. God, you're you're a stalwart you get us through a lot of little bumps along the way so thanks for everything you yeah. did in LA. Tip, I didn't want Tiffany to speak today because she spoke at Stetson at the orientation she did three modules in a day I'm like she blew it off the charts. Like I'm like, I don't want don't don't be sharing don't <laughs> be sharing these reviews with me. <laughs> great. Great. These are better okay, than well, ours. Hey John, one more question from, from somebody asking, how do I post my CLE credits if I'm not admitted to the bar? If you're not admitted to the bar, you just got a full day of lawyer support preparation for a great career, but CLE credits don't, um, they're not uh, active if you're not a member of the bar. All right. So, so, so the, the, requirement, the requirement to have the hours uh, starts when you actually have the license, right? Yeah. I, that's my understanding. You know, like law students don't, don't do CLE events unless they want to do them. You know, we have several okay. students on today, but they do it for, their own education. All right. How many so, uh, for, and, and if anyone on here has a question in the future, or if we are wrong, just call us. We'll, we can look up your CLE. We can, we can verify your attendance, the whole thing. Right. And uh, taking up Christine Bilbray's invitation from the Florida bar, feel free to reach out if you, if you want to, you know, their answer, just pose the same question. Okay. All right. All righty. I don't want to close it down uh, prematurely, but um, John, if you have everything you need uh, and, and we've accomplished the program, then I don't want people to feel they have to stay. So we can bring it to a close. Give me one second here. Don't worry, Lewis can't go home until about nine o'clock at night. He's in Miami. <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you, Dan. We, I'm I'm done. Lewis, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anytime, anytime, Dan. Anytime, John. Have a great we'll weekend. Be in touch with you next week. Thank you. All right. You Thanks again, all. Thanks for those who are still with us. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you see you around the around the bend. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.